My next guest is Leith Van Onselen, the unconventional economist and co-founder of macrobusiness.com.au. Uh, and by the way, I have a subscription. I acquired, bought a subscription to that service and it is one of the best. It's very well, well worth getting because it gives a perceptive analysis of the economics and politics of the day. Welcome, Leith. G'day, David. Thanks for having me on again. Not at all. Now, uh, I saw your piece about Australians could have been the richest people in the world, and that was based on a chart which was in the Fin Review, wasn't it? Uh, that, was, uh, that was fascinating. What's the story? Why, why could we have been the richest people in the world? And why aren't we? Yeah, look... Uh, well, yeah, yeah the, the, the story is pretty simple. So basically since uh, the mid-2000s, when the commodity price boom kicked off, Australia has had the experience, the largest rise in what economists call the terms of trade in the world. So what the terms of trade is, it's basically our, the price we receive for our exports versus the price we pay for our, ex, uh, our imports. So what's happened is because of the commodity price boom, Australia's export prices have rocketed more than anywhere else in the world. So talking, you know, uh, iron ore, coal, natural gas, those sorts of things. And that should have made the country a lot richer because it's effectively like getting a pay rise. So, for example, if, you know, if you sell a service and your pay suddenly, you know, triples and the cost of everything else doesn't rise commensurably, you should be far richer. But unfortunately, what Australia, what's happened in Australia is we've had this massive commodity price boom, and yet Australians haven't captured the benefit of that boom. And the reason for that is because our mining companies are all foreign-owned, and what's happened is they have effectively captured the profits from that boom, and Australians as, as a people, we haven't captured the uplift in those commodity prices through greater taxation you know, resource rents, all those sorts of things. We have captured a little bit of it, but not nearly enough. And by way of comparison, Norway uh, has done the complete opposite to us. So, for example, Norway is a major exporter in oil and gas, and it taxes its oil and gas industry at a, at a, at a rate of around 80%. And what that's meant is that Norway uh, has accumulated what's called a sovereign wealth fund. So it's basically this a ginormous pension fund that's run by the government. And that pension fund has basically grabbed those oil and, and gas profits, invested it overseas in overseas assets. So we're talking, you know, shares in Microsoft and all these other companies. And that sovereign wealth fund has grown so big now that it's, that's now worth about $280,000 US per resident of Norway. So 5.5 million people in Norway share in this ginormous pot, this ginormous pension fund that is worth about $280,000 per resident. Now, by contrast, Australia is sitting on way more, re or, uh, way, way more natural resources than, than Norway. And we could have done a similar thing and we could be the richest people on earth. But unfortunately, David, we've done the opposite. We've effectively given it away to foreign companies and to make matters worse, in the areas of gas, for example, we now on the East Coast pay some of the highest gas prices in the world because unlike every other gas exporting region of the world, we don't reserve that gas for domestic use. And what's happened is, just today as I'm speaking to you, the East Coast gas price has hit $20 per gigajoule of gas. Now, it used to be $3 historically. So it's gone through the roof. And just by way of comparison, Residents of the United States pay about $4 in Australian dollars per gigajoule. So we're paying about five times more than, than, than uh, residents of the United States. And yet United States is actually the biggest gas exporter in the world. They recently overtook us. And the reason for that is because Americans reserve their gas for domestic use. And they say, effectively, you have to supply Americans first and then you can export the rest. But what Australia does is we, we say, export whatever you want, and charge us whatever you want. And as a result, we have a cost of, we have, we have a cost of living crisis and we also have manufacturers yes. collapsing at an alarming rate because of costs. I was looking at the uh, GDP, the gross domestic 
product per capita on, based on uh, PPP in relation to different countries. And I noticed that Norway is about a third higher than us. But Singapore, Singapore, which has nothing, is twice Australia's. How could that be? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it, it is interesting. So, so Singapore is what they call, a, a, I think it's an entrepot uh, nation. So it's basically a, a hub nation. where it's, it's a hub for financial services. It's a hub for, for actual trade. And it does have a government that seems to work for, in the interests of Singaporeans. So, for example, it has a ginormous public housing, uh, you know, sector, which effectively applies, you know, gives Singaporeans fairly cheap housing for example, and it has low tax rates and those sorts of things. So yeah, Norway is, uh, sorry, Singapore is certainly a special case, but I prefer to compare Australia to other natural resource countries because that's effectively what we are. And I think Norway is a classic example of a country that does it best. And as a result, they are incredibly rich. And we are arguably a nation that does it the worst because we don't capture the benefits. And in fact, we gouge ourselves. We allow, we, we, we've allowed a, a handful of multinational uh, energy companies to basically charge us some of the highest energy prices in the world on the East Coast, which is basically part of the reason why we have stubbornly high inflation. We've got a cost of living crisis because we're all paying way more for energy. And it's also why we don't have a competitive manufacturing sector and manufacturers are closing down left, right and centre because the energy costs are so high. So, you know, really, we, we are a stupid country that does exactly the wrong things. And uh, when it comes to then spending the taxes that we get, our governments seem to be extraordinarily incompetent. And I think the best example is the NDIS, which uh, is costing us, what, about uh, 60 something, or it will soon cost us within a couple of years, 60 billion a year. And they say that uh, in the 2030s, it'll go up to over 120 billion a year if it continues the same way. And Andrew Charlton, who's an economist, and uh, is the Prime Minister's favourite. He chose him, handpicked him for Parramatta. He's now a member. Before he became a member, he wrote a piece in the Sydney Morning Herald in which he blamed the design of the NDIS on the Labour Party, said the Labour Party designed it this way to stop... They thought that uh, Abbott would win the 2010 election. The High Court intervened, so he didn't. But they thought that if he won it, he would reform it. So they set up the NDIS so that it is not really answerable to the minister who is responsible to it, to the parliament. It's just autonomous and it's just out of control. Yeah, it is. Look, 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 look the NDIS has been set up as a gigantic money pit. And unfortunately, you know, we, we've created a system here that is easily easy to rort. So if you want to be a middleman who, you know, an NDIS provider, there are a lot of good ones out there, but you could easily be a shonk that um, that effectively, you know, uh, defrauds the taxpayer. And, and unfortunately, you know, we have, we have a system now whereby uh, providers, well, I should say, um, you know, paediatricians or so-called experts are actually incentivized to give people, you know, diagnosis of autism when they really shouldn't. And as a result, we have, you know, I, I can't remember what the exact stat was, but I think it was like one in five young children now, or maybe it's one in 10, are now being diagnosed with autism. Like just, just the, you know, don't, don't quote me on that, but it's an extraordinary number. Yes. And it's especially and it boys, isn't there. it? It's especially boys. That's right, be, yes. Be yeah, sorry, one allegedly. in five or one in 10. Just, uh, yes. Australian boys have autism. Now, now I'll, 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 just for disclosure, I have a heavily autistic son who's on the NDIS. But he is non-verbal. He is a, you know, seriously, he goes to the uh, 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 special school and he, he, you know, I can't talk to him basically and he's 16. So he is a, he's, he's a real case. But I see a lot of cases that aren't real cases of fairly normal children who just go to, go to a mainstream school, play sport, have friends, get good marks. They're just normal, but they're still being given these autism diagnoses. And that the whole system is just grown too big. And, and the alarming thing, for, thing is for the economy, David, is that the NDIS has grown so big now that it's effectively absorbing resources from all other areas of the economy. So we're talking workers and, you know, financial resources, et cetera. And unfortunately, you know, government-led uh, jobs in healthcare 
and in social security, et cetera, very low productivity jobs. Now, I'm not saying the people who do it aren't important. They're just industries that don't exhibit strong productivity growth historically. And the problem with it is if we keep growing the labor market in those areas, we're going to end up with a low productivity economy. And I think that I think the, the ballooning of the NDIS is actually one of the reasons why Australia's productivity growth is so poor. Yes. Uh, right. Because we have, it, it's, a, it's a ginormously growing sector. Now, given that uh, our income comes mainly from our resources, what happens when you, for example, increase the population suddenly by 20% or some ridiculous figure? You have the out of control immigration. Does that mean that the wealth of Australia is then reduced? by bringing in the, yes. this extra population. So what, what, yes, well, it, what are they up to then? Sorry. What are they up to in, in this out of control immigration? Yeah, look, 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 it's an absolutely stupid policy for a commodity rich country to run. So, you know, for example, and, and, and everything you said is 100% right if Australia captured the benefits properly. So again, I'll, I'll draw you to the counterpoint. Norway has 5.5 million people is sitting on a sovereign wealth fund that's worth about $280,000 US per resident. If Norway was to double its population to 11 million people, suddenly that sovereign wealth fund would be worth $140,000 US per resident. So Norway has an explicit financial incentive not to run a high population growth policy because effectively what it does is it dilutes its resource base and its wealth amongst more people and it would make them poorer. Australia, by contrast, does the exact opposite. We run an incredibly high population growth policy. We had 2.5% population growth in the in last calendar year, 650,000 people, an enormous amount of people. So we effectively dilute our mineral wealth. But to make matters worse, we don't actually even, uh, you know, um, tax the benefit. We, we actually don't receive the benefit of that resource wealth because we don't tax the sector correctly. And we effectively give it away to multinationals who then charge us high prices when it comes to areas like energy, which then pushes up a gas and electricity prices. So Australia does everything back to front. And, you know, quite frankly, David, I'd be happy to outsource government to Norway because we, <laughs> we probably get a much better system as a result because we are ruled by idiots. That includes the Norwegian uh, Labor governments which have been in power, does it not? They seem to be more oh, sensible yeah, than, than ours. Y yeah, that's right. And look, look, I'd even, I'd even you know, uh, I'd even take Western Australia's government, to be quite frank, because, you know, the, the Carpenter government, I think I think that was Labor in 2004, yes, that's I right. believe it was. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they introduced a, a West Coast gas reservation policy and they, they effectively required 15% of all gas ex exports. So WA has a massive gas resources, just like the East Coast does. And what that's basically done is it's ensured that Western Australians pay low gas and electricity prices. Us on the East Coast could have done that, but we didn't. And... We're instead paying, you know, as of today, twenty dollars a gigajoule for our gas. When historically, before we started exporting it, it was three dollars a gigajoule, and we could have done what Western Australia has done. And Western Australia has been insulated from the energy price spike that happened when Russia invaded Ukraine. Us on the east coast, we're not. We're paying some of the world's highest prices, despite the fact we export eighty percent of it, and most of it to China. And and here's another statistic, David. You know, the the Victorian government and other governments are telling us that. Australian households must get off gas to meet net zero. The absurdity of it is that we burn more gas converting it to liquid for export than Australian households using gas. So it's like, how can you tell Australians that we're not allowed to use gas because it's bad for the environment at the same time as we're literally burning more gas just to convert it to liquid to then put it on a ship to sell it to China? This well, is the absurdity of the people running yes. our country. I've learned something new and I noticed in the, I think it was in the financial review the other day that the, uh, the Japanese have a surplus of gas from Australia. They've got more than they need and, and they're on selling their, the gas that they're getting from us at a great profit. And you tell me that also the, yeah. the Chinese are doing, that the Chinese communists are doing the same thing. Yes, yes. So, so, you know, we're being told we've got a gas shortage on the East Coast and that, you know, we must build import terminals now for our gas. That's the absurdity of it. Like we literally pull it out, out of the ground over there. And one of the solutions is to build an import terminal so that we can import gas into a country which exports 80% of our gas. And yet the, the two main countries that we sell that gas to, China and 
and Japan have a surplus of gas from us and they're now re-exporting the gas. It's just absurd. And just, just, just to highlight how the absurdity of it, David, can you imagine, you know, we are a Middle Eastern equivalent nation of gas, right? So we, if we were an oil exporter, we'd be like a Middle Eastern country. Mm. Can you imagine the Middle Eastern country, like if Saudi Arabia, for example, Saudi Arabian paying $2 a litre for petrol and then having a, a shortage of oil. So the solution then is to build an oil import terminal so they can import oil from other areas of the Middle East. That is effectively what Australia, what the East Coast wants to do with gas. We've engineered an artificial shortage, even though we export 80% of it. We pay some of the world's highest prices, even though we export 80% of it. We're, we're telling Australian households that we must get off gas, even though we use more gas, convert it to liquid to then put on a ship to sell to China. The absurdity knows no bounds. And we need politicians to look after our interests, not everybody else's interests first. And sadly, we just don't have that in Australia. There is also an interesting phenomenon, and uh, we won't name anybody because of the laws of defamation, but we do have the situation where politicians leave office, sometimes uh, saying they want to be more, spend more time with their families. They get very good uh, superannuation and uh, other advantages, other jobs in Australia, but so often, so many of them seem to then become lobbyists involved in the mining companies for whom they've set up this very favourable system. Is this uh, something about which governments should be concerned and electors should be concerned? Yes, and I know exactly the people you're talking about and I won't name them either, either and, they, and they extend across both aisles of, of Parliament. Um, yes, it certainly is something that, that, that we should be concerned about because it's cronyism. It's, it, you know, it is especially concerning when politicians set up the rules which allow foreign multinationals to gouge us to then rip us off with high energy prices and for us not to gain the benefit from the resources that we own. And then for those same politicians to move into the industry who they've just given, you know, advantageous uh, rules to. And that is effectively what Australia does. And we've done it across a whole range of industries. But I'd argue that, you know, when it comes to energy it is particularly egregious because energy is a, is a vital cost in all of our cost of living. It determines whether or not we have a, a competitive industries. And, you know, only two months ago, Australia's last major plastics supplier, Quinos, left Australia. It, it shut down because of high gas prices. And those high gas prices didn't need to be like that. But they're only like that because our idiot politicians decided to approve all these East Coast gas export projects without any domestic gas reservation. We're literally, East Coast Australia is literally the only gas exporting region of the world that doesn't have a domestic reservation policy. And as a result, the historical price for East Coast gas has gone from $3 a gigajoule up to $20. And it's made, it's driven up all our cost of living. It's one of the reasons why Australia has stubbornly high inflation. And it's one of the reasons why manufacturers are, uh, you know, are closing down left, right and centre because they simply cannot compete because energy is a vital component of a manufacturer's cost base. I can remember at the time when there was a debate as to whether we on the East Coast should have a gas reservation policy, there was a strong argument saying, well, that goes against classical economics. You shouldn't be disturbing the market. That, that would be wrong to do. do. Do you remember that? Oh, I remember it. I remember it very clearly. It happened. I, I remember it extremely clearly. And we had, you know, a lot of bad actors during that, both from, you know, the political side and also from uh, think tanks. I remember the Grattan Institute argued extensively against gas reservations, saying that it was economically inefficient. And they also argued for Western Australia to get rid of their uh, domestic reservation. Well, you know, you fast forward a decade and Western Australian, you know, Russia invades Ukraine and Western Australia basically is insulated from the, from the uh, energy shock. And then on the East Coast here, we're, we're gouged ruthlessly and we have a cost of living crisis. Uh, you know, I'm a Victorian and, and the, 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 the cost we have to pay to heat our homes is absolutely absurd. Mm. And then we have manufacturers now closing down left, right and centre because of high energy prices. Is that economically efficient? Yes. And then now the solution, David... The, the, sorry, the solution, if you don't mind me adding to this, is instead of fixing the energy problem at its source, now Albo 
wants to throw billions of dollars at his future made policy to boost manufacturing. So effectively, we're going to have uh, the only manufacturers that are going to survive in Australia are going to be ones who are going to live off government handouts. Is that really an efficient economy? I'd argue it's not. So you're not uh, impressed by politicians who say that our future is to be a renewables superpower. I don't understand what a renewables superpower is, but uh, there seems to be a lot of talk about it in government circles, especially when they're giving a few billion dollars to some very rich people to in engage in some financial activity. Yeah, no, no. My, what, what I'd like to see them do is uh, simply deliver us cheap energy like we should have because we are an energy superpower. And the best way to do that is to fix the gas market. You fix the gas market, you then fix the electricity market because gas sets the electricity price. So, you know, if the, if the politicians merely fixed the gas market, delivered us cheap energy like we should have, given that we are a Saudi Arabian equivalent of gas, then a manufacturing industry could compete off its own own accord. Instead, they've delivered us the overly expensive energy, which has made us not competitive. And then in order to try and boost manufacturing now, they're going to hand out taxpayer resources. And here's a question, David. The Albanese government wants us to become, wants us to build our own solar panels, even though we'll never compete with China. <laughs> well, where's the plastics going to, where's the plastics going to come from to go in those solar panels when Australia's last plastics manufacturer just shut down because of high energy prices? Guess what? We're going to have to import that plastic from China when we could have made it ourselves, but we can't because we've got high energy prices thanks to government failure. This is how idiot, uh, it, it, this is the idiocy that is behind Australia's policy making. And the reason why I have, you know, I'm, I'm not very confident about the future of this country. No, I'm afraid I'm not either. I long ago felt that we were going to become the Argentina of the South Seas, principally because of the activities of our politicians. So before you go, if there is a silver bullet, and there never is a real silver bullet, but if there's something like a silver bullet, you say the big thing that they should be attending to is the gas market. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the, the reason why gas is so important is because, A, we're swimming in the stuff, and we should, we should have, you know, Australians shouldn't be paying more than, you know, much more than the marginal cost of pulling gas out of the ground, right? So we should be delivering Australians, number one, incredibly cheap gas, and then we can export the rest. And, and I'd also argue that we should have export levies on that gas, so then we, then we can raise proper revenue from that gas. You know, it would end up being similar to what Norway does. Yes. Um, but, you know, if, if you deliver cheap gas, you then have cheap electricity because gas is the marginal price setter of electricity and it's the firming power used for electricity. And if you just simply fix that, you could deliver Australians cheap energy prices and then we'd have lower cost of living because all our bills would come down as households and then as, and as businesses if you're a cafe owner you know your electricity and gas costs come down if you on your gas cookers and all those sorts of things and then if you're a manufacturer you'll compete you'll be you'll be very cost competitive because suddenly unlike most other countries in the world you'd have lower energy prices and that'd offset a higher wage costs and everything else so yeah I, I, my, my number one solution would be to fix the energy crisis by fixing the gas market and again, I'll say, why is it that Americans can pay four dollars a gigajoule for gas, yet they are the biggest exporters in the world? Yet Australians, who are also one of the biggest exporters in the world, I think we're number three now. We were number one. Pays twenty dollars a gigajoule for gas on the east coast. It just doesn't make sense. We should have the cheapest gas and electricity prices in the world because we are swimming in energy. We are an energy superpower. Well, thank you, Leith. You, you've given us really a lot of uh, information, there's a lot of valuable information which viewers can get if they want to in the newsletters from and the site from macrobusiness.com.au. As I say, I've taken out a subscription. I haven't asked for a discount because of uh, any advantage and it's very well worth reading. I would recommend it strongly. Thank you. Thank you, Leith. Thanks, David. Speak to you next time. Certainly. Bye.